Okay. Keyboard's working for the moment. Oh my god, I cannot read that. I'm sorry, but I cannot read this. I shall document the curious events that have transpired with myself. I will document the curious events that have transpired with myself, my family, friends, and cow crackers. <laughs> it looks like cow crack. I have no idea what that says. Hartnell was a peaceful was a peaceful mining town founded by my grandfather and nestled within the red rock of the desert in the Arizona territory. He's 163, it's 163 inhabitants heard a mysterious explosion on the night of June 27th, 1903. I sent several workers through the town to verify that the explosion had not caused any injuries or damage to mining equipment. They returned and reported that, what is that? That it must have been a loud clap of thunder caused by lightning for they found no damage. It was not until the night, it was not until the light of the next morning that we were amazed to realize something profound had indeed occurred. Sorry I'm reading so slow and choppy, but it is really hard to read cursive when it's all blurry and it's kind of faded because the texture wants to make it look old. It seems at some point during that night, our entire mining facility, and a large circle of the land around it seemed to have been swept, scooped up, and carried off to a completely different place. All without anyone knowing about it. All right, so they did get abducted. <laughs> Their whole mining operation was abducted. Oh god, more handwritten text. Please suffer with me through this. Let's do this together. The entire landscape outside of our circle of desert could only be described as alien. Large floating rocks could be seen in the distance. No one had ever seen anything like it anywhere on Earth. We fully explored our new surroundings, hoping to find a way home. No way home was ever found. In fact, we seem dis in fact, we soon discovered what we take for granted now. Not only could we not get back home, we also could not access the landscape outside the desert. Curiously, we discovered that a flow of water was provided from a high point of rock, and we discovered a small tree growing in the very center of the circle. Our central tree that is so important to our lives here was just a mere sapling back then.
Alright, legal pad. Species description. Mofang. Through ambassador seeds, the Mofang were the first non-human species humans were introduced to. An Liang was the first to call the alien a Mofang. Impressed with their advanced ability to imitate our sounds, movements, and mannerisms. Although they have a name for themselves, their language is mostly unpronounceable by humans. As a result, and because of their mimicry abilities, communication with the Mofang is primarily accomplished by their learning human languages rather than humans learning to speak Mofang. They have been able to learn almost every human language represented in Hunrath enough to provide functional, if rudimentary, communication. The Mofang basic external morphology is remarkably humanoid. Bilateral symmetrical tetrapods, bipedal, head with anterior facial features. Mouth, looks like there's another page. Eyes, nostrils. Other external features include minimal body hair and raised dorsal protrusions. Constitution is somewhat frail due to apparently due apparently to their thin and lightweight internal structure, but internal investigation has not been possible. They have ample cranial space to account for a substantial brain, and their intelligence is impressive as evidenced by their advanced technology. Oh, yes, that is indeed alien. Awry. After a certain level of maturity and health of the tree, a passage opened at its base. This passage allowed contact with two additional species. The first contact was with the Arai. The first contact revealed the Arai to be large, beetle-like insects. We were unable to communicate directly with them in any way, but they appeared to have some rudimentary level of intelligence. It was Loreen Toth who first made the journey through the heart to Kaptar, and named both the New World and the inhabitants. The Arai have their have three distinct variants that have been that have come to be referred to as Barnacle, Beetle, and Polyarch. Although their morphology is dramatically different from human, their internal systems, like all of our neighbors, are supported by similar atmospheric composition and basic nutrients. Are those the flying insects I've seen? In their barnacle stage, the Arai are completely immobile. The Arai stay in this egg-like development state seemingly indefinitely. In order to hatch, they must be in proximity of a polyarch and fertilized by the beetles after a certain stage of maturity. The beetles are the eyes and ears, hands and feet. With only a minimal nervous system of their own, they are essentially the sensory extensions of the immobile polyarchs. They are able to execute simple commands, but they apparently have very little in the way of individual sentience. I guess that's a beetle. The Arai polyarchs are the intelligence and consciousness of the species. Although it was obvious that there was intelligence behind the species, it wasn't until Caroline Farley began spending large amounts of time in cl close proximity that deeper communication began. With a room nearby, Farley was the first to communicate non-verbally and learn much about the species, including some historical information. The Arai species survived in their world while several other sentient species came and went, among them an ancient species who formed a deeper relationship with the Arai, carving temples and dwellings for them in the rocks. And later, a more recent species that took over much of their homeworld. This latter species was especially adept at mechanical cons construction, using it mostly to capture and process lar larvae? I can't read what that says. Larvae? process large flying creatures using the beetles as bait. Ooh. All right, this is what I wanted to learn about. The Veline. The final species to be discovered were the Veline. 
The, the Valine had been communicating with the RI for many years through ambassador seeds, but became, but became part of the larger community very shortly after the Arai. With a large and imposing frame and a form of communication based on a complex, multi-voiced, low-frequency rumble, the initial introductions were intimidating. After several attempts, Emile Vidal was able to begin some rudimentary communication and began visiting the Veline in Marais, which she named on a regular basis. She discovered a complex and amazing society that was able to use their technology in unexpected ways. They had the ability to quickly transform their world using extruded structures based on some form of complex miniature substrate material. So these are the people that um, CW was trying to fool someone into thinking he had gotten technology from. Unlike the other worlds, the Villine Sphere is scooped out of a Villine resettlement group that was preparing to set off into space to find a new home world. This was their way of life, to put themselves into stasis and scatter themselves throughout the stars. As mentioned previously, their appearance is imposing, standing about nine feet tall with a distinct reptilian resemblance. They have six limbs, two muscular legs and arms, and a smaller set of arms. They control every aspect of their technology with their vocalizations, but over the years they have created control panels based on their number system that allow other species to easier access elements of their technology. It's nice of them to share. Whoa! Imposing indeed. Before I read this, I'm just going to take a sip of this water. Ooh. You know what? It looks like this part's been going on 50 minutes. I should have brought it to an end when I uh, walked into this house. But that's okay. I'll just split it up. So this is currently part 5. Let's continue reading. Seed information. Okay. Ambassador seeds. Ambassador seeds. Ambassador seeds were first documented about 150 Earth years ago. They occur about once every 400 days if the trees remain healthy. Natural seeds, natural seed swaps occur between pairs of seeds that we now know dropped simultaneously from healthy trees in paired sphere. When each seed was touched by species in sphere, the swap occurred, sending an ambassador from each sphere to the paired sphere. Location of the swap is defined by the locations of the pairs of seeds. After the first swap, the seeds recharged quickly, allowing for a quick return. First matings, is that matings? First meetings were intense, but naturally short. It was quite a surprise for both the Mofang and us. Over time, the seeds required more time to recharge, producing longer visits between species. Okay, collector seeds. Everyone who arrives is familiar with the collector seeds. Oh, not me. Oh, maybe the collector seeds is what brought me here. The bright light that we will, were all drawn to right before the event that brought us here is a collector seed. Okay. What new arrivers may not be aware of is that these seeds, like all seeds, come in pairs. When the tree drops a collector seed on the ground, it signals that its twin has begun its quest for a new being. That search may take hours or may take years. In an appropriate situation, a natural threat of death is found. The seed activates and swaps a smaller but very sized sphere f from Earth, or whatever appropriate homeworld, here to Hunrath. 
Okay. So So I guess I was captured in a sphere and teleported here and um that's why the trees were growing in the cave because it had taken a sphere of the um the area that I was in. And there was that lantern I remember seeing. So that makes sense now. I was a, taken in a tiny little sphere and transported inside of a cave. So that's why that weird sight was there. That's awesome. All right. This Hunrath, this Hunrath became more populous and would watch for a, let's reset my view here. As Hunrath became more populous, we would watch for newly dropped collector seed. Watch for a new, newly dropped collector seed, collect it, and place it in the entry canyon area. This allowed us to provide a more predictable entry experience for new arrivers and provide a single area to collect any resources that may have come along with the new arriver. Okay, so that's someone picked up. The seed that dropped, placed it in that cave, and and for some reason they weren't able to greet me properly. Unlike ambassador seeds and mother seeds, collector seeds do not seem to survive. The inner core is spent having only the lifeless outer husk. Yes, I've seen that. Mother seeds, all right. Postulated, but unverified. First suggested by Alima Hamsa, 2232B, I can't read that, man. The notion of mother seeds extrapolates the behavior of the lesser seeds to a super seed. She posited that the process that actually created the paired spheres was similar to all other swaps, but on a much grander scale. So she's saying maybe these spheres were in, these big spheres. Oops, sorry. These big spheres were created by a similar process. And I just noticed that that notebook there, that legal pad's on the same page that I ended on. That's cool. Nice that it does that. Great touch. The idea is that two seeds from a mother tree were scattered on the galactic winds to find appropriately similar environments. When matches were found, some process was triggered that swapped large portions of landscaped, swapped large portions of landscape between vastly different worlds Alima further noted that the tree, tree's locations in the center of the spheres suggested that the trees grew from these mother seeds. Because of the similarities, it has been conjectured that reswapping the entire environmental spheres might be possible with a larger scale version of the ambassador seed machine. Ah. At the last page. It looks like that is the last page. Interesting backstory that they've created for this game. I like it. I can use this projector. Can I unlock the door? Nice. Welcome. Another notebook. More reading. Okay. Looks like this is the welcome book. Welcome to Hunrath. Please give us a bit of information about you so that we can get to know you a little better. Um, 
oh name so hard to read i'm sorry name date you came from please use four digit year where you came from country and city circumstance under which you were taken please note any dangers you noticed emptied and filed 12,000 AH, 13,000 AH, 15,000 AH. Whoa. Okay. Samuel Karen, Karen, January 2017. Something Madagascar. I had just served, I had just arrived and was, God, why do they make it so faint? I had just arrived and was driving my supply truck along the coast south of Morakara, Manakara, when I recall being washed away, whisked away. What is that? Now it's washed away and the seed appeared. And 15,257 AH, male, age 61. So interesting, January 2017 hasn't happened yet. It's next month though, as I record this. Uziel Regenbogen, <laughs> 1942, March. Ooh. Lübeck, Germany. It's during the Second World War. The last thing I recall is a large rumbling while I was hiding in the cellar of a vacant building. I ran toward a bright light in a stairwell. 15,841 AH, male 26. Maria Gallego. September 1988, I was eight months old and she was stolen from Earth. Cozumel, Mexico. On my boat. <laughs> On my boat in a bad storm. Female, 40, age 46. Um, Gary, I can't read that. March of 2042, Portland, United States of America, skiing, Mount Hood, a male, age 37. So am I able to write my name in here? I am not. I should be following protocol, even though this place is obviously a little bit... Um, it's not operating the way it's supposed to. Let's just put it that way. Anything I can actually do with this? Rewind. Oh, that was fast forward. Nope. Oh, that just flipped it around. Okay. We're on the other side. I don't know if it's fully rewound. Oh, we all lost everything. Something's happening. Everything but our stories. And they shouldn't be forgotten. I was three. It was April of 1983. 
see, so it was 1870 for you, Sam, and uh, you tell it like it was yesterday, but it's been 62 years since you saw that blast of light. And that's where all of our news stories began, that light. Streaked across the sky, mesmerizing, but unnerving. Some of you were alone. I wasn't. My dear grandma, God bless her, rejoiced as if it was some forebearer of good fortune. <laughs> Vera, you said you were all smiling. None of us understood. But, well, we followed. Whether it was in the deep woods like Cecil or right outside town like Jane and Jenny, we were drawn to see more. Yep. Grandma lifted me from the carriage on the porch and walked into the yard so we could watch it unobstructed. Even in daylight, Joseph, you said it was gloriously bright. But in the twilight, it was spellbinding. And we all felt some kind of trepidation and yet attraction as we approached it and it approached us. So close, so radiant, and that sound deep and vibrant, organic. You all remember. There was no turning away. It advanced, almost like purposefully spinning slowly until, well, it found us, each of us. We should tell these stories because it did save us and, and there must be more. I was watching the sunrise. It was about, uh, t about 2 30 in the morning. September 26, 1948. May 7th, 2009. September 3rd, 1995. I was down by the river. I was hiking in the desert. In the park with my grandson. I looked up and saw a brilliant flash of light that stood on it in the sky. The light it just it clouds the clouds and behind the trees and it disappeared. I looked around and, you know, to see if there was anyone around. See if anyone else had seen what I had seen. There was no one around. They all saw it too. Oh. If I turn too far, it... Oh, at least it just pauses. I turned my head too far and it went away. Found me too. Okay. Let's flip to the other side. See if I missed anything on that side. Really, if I got to the end of the tip, I shouldn't have to rewind since I flipped it over. Isn't that how cassettes used to work? I used to have a cassette player and listen to cassettes, but it's been a while, as you might imagine. I like how the record button's broken, so I can't record any messages. Let's see if there's anything on this. 
Well, I, I feel like I should, I should say something. We, we haven't heard from Shavar. So, well, um, should we assume that um, Shiv uh, Shivar, well, that the, the attack is inevitable. It's, we, we just don't know when. So, um, Shavar and her family, um, and others she trusts, I guess, well, they'll, they'll arrive when they can, um, when they can, without, um, giving, you know, like, uh, covertly. the place of the um most are gone there's just the beetle a place i uh, left here now the mayor got out early <laughs> um, i don't even know why i'm recording this it's, yeah i don't either because you're kind of incoherent there lady like somehow big we'll sense on or something um i guess this has meaning if someone listens but a new one? A new arriver. Oh, God, the kiosk out front. Uh, I need to update that message. Oh. Is that it? Still spinning, but hmm, I think that's it. What's this? Not that, but this. Okay. Earth, Soria, where the Mo Fang are from. Okay, so number one, seed pair. Number two, find planets with similar atmospheres. Three, swap. Four, tree from seed. Heart superposition. Heart connected, path open when mature. Four species meet. What happens at fruition? Swap where? Home? When? Maybe be dead. More seed pairs scattered throughout the universe. Why scattering? Hmm. I like how they did this board with actual, it looks like actual pieces of paper are on the board rather than it being just a texture. Very nice. And I can't quite read that. My brother, small and nice, sings constantly as noisy as a rock concert. If only he would be quiet. Okay. So I'm going to end this here, and in part six, I'll take a look at uh, what we've got with the projector here. Looks to be plugged into the wall and should work. So for now, 
I'll walk outside and wish you farewell.